you folks tell me, how can a known poison that exists in our food supply or medications and sometimes even in the air you breathe be totally overlooked as the cause of disease in America? Watch me now and soon you too will know the cause. I cannot see still. We have a component out that I can't see from the uh, from the servers, from the devices in the control room on TV here. We got it fixed the other day, but it was a bad piece, so we got to fix it again. And I am uh, perspiring. I apologize for that. We did a lot of shooting this morning, and I'm going to share some of that with you because it's important. Uh, and then I, I put together today's shows and took care of a lot of business. By the way, <clears throat> we are off. I'll talk to Damon and... and I haven't had a chance to talk to Damon and John about this yet and the guys, but uh, I'm going to be gone uh, early next week. We're going to see our son. Uh, I'm going on an airplane, which I literally cannot believe, but I am going to. That's how much I love them. They are pregnant with their first baby, and uh, we want to go out and spend a little time with them. So I'm going to hop on an airplane with my wonderful wife, and we're going to spend a few days out there. I'm hoping... Uh, that we'll be back Thursday, we will be back Wednesday, but I, I've just learned we're going to be back too late to do this show at 2.30 on Wednesday. So I'm hoping the guys will give me Thursday morning and Friday morning. Most of you, there's only a few hundred people in here now. Most of the thousands of people who watch this, 90% of them, you know, 95% of them watch it uh, sometime later. <clears throat> so I want to get started on uh, things we've gone over uh, on the shows, and I want to now do it on TV because it's all brand new information. You haven't seen it yet. And I think, John, I'm going to start with where you and I talked about today. I think that would be the best, best way to do this. <clears throat> uh, ta, 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 ta. Okay. Uh, folks, uh, the question has arisen many times, Doug, should I take omega-3 fatty acids? I'm in love with omega-3 fatty acids, omega-6, you know, but uh, omega-3 fatty acids. You can study 9s, 12s, and so forth, but omega-3 fatty acids from salmon, tuna, uh, and here are my notes, have long been proven off offer health benefits, protecting the heart, the brain, although scientists don't know exactly how. <laughs> Thank you, John. Although scientists don't know exactly how. How much money goes into studying the science of fish oils, EPA, DHA, and, and the like? Very little, unless you're a company that is doing the work and marketing the tablets, uh, you know, the capsules of omega uh, fatty acids. <clears throat> the government really doesn't want to be involved. Um, the government has wings of it, like the Food and Drug Administration, that uh, derive income from what some might consider competition to omega-3 fatty acids, heart-healthy supplements. And that would be statin drugs. Last 20 years, billions, trillions of them have sold. And uh, to, the, uh, uh, you know, to the end that uh, pharmaceutical companies, well, here's another paper I got today. The biopharmaceutical industry provides 75% of the FDA's drug review budget. Is this a problem? This was in uh, Forbes magazine here a short time ago. The pharmaceutical companies provide 75% of the FDA's budget to review their products. Huge conflict of interest, my opinion. But why would the FDA then study competition with what the drug companies are making to provide them with an income? I, I don't think that would be uh, wise. So. Here's where we're sitting. This was some research I pulled out from the scientific literature. <clears throat> this appeared, uh, uh, fish oil appears to help protect against heart failure.com. Fish oil supplements may work slightly better than a popular cholesterol reducing drug to help patients with chronic heart failure. I like that headline. In a parallel study, a team of Italian doctors gave a couple thousand patients the statin drug Crestor. Um, gosh, I didn't write down when this study was done. Well, Crestor is probably a five or six year old drug, probably five or six years ago. So these Italian doctors gave 2,200 people the statin drug Crestor and gave a placebo pill to another 2,200 people. Patients were then tracked for about four years. The doctors found little difference in the 
uh, heart failure rates among the two groups of people. Comparing the results of both studies, researchers concluded, I'm sorry, half got Crestor, half got fish oil. Pa, 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 pa. The researchers concluded that the fish oil is slightly more effective than uh, Crestor because it performed better against uh, it, it, it performed better against Crestor. It's a small benefit, but we should always be emphasizing to patients what they can do in terms of diet that might help, said Richard Bonow, president of the Car of cardiology at Northwestern University Hospital in Chicago and the past president of the American Heart Association. He's a smart guy. And he, his group found out if you, if you put 2,000 people on fish oils, and 2,000 on Crestor, the fish oil worked a little bit better. Uh, here's another one. This is out of a News Medical uh, Net. News Medical Net states, researchers from the University of California, Irvine, have conducted statistical analysis that predicts that more than 70,000 heart attack strokes <clears throat> and other adverse events could be prevented each year in the U.S. through the use of highly purified fish oil therapy. I'm on board with this. I'm reading these studies uh, and I'm thinking, okay, I should take, and I do, uh, a fish oil. Not every day, I, I rotate, you guys know my pattern, I rotate things because I have access to thousands of things. We all do, but there are many uh, companies that uh, offer us trials and I'm always open to that. So here we saw we could probably prevent, says UC Irvine out in California, we could probably prevent 70,000 cardiovascular events if we'd start taking fish oil. But fish oil, as I opened with, does compete with statin drugs. And folks, you need to know how the innards work. It's important that you know this. A few months ago, a large study regarding omega-3 fatty acids was published by the Journal of the American Medical Association. This is the medical gospel of heart doctors, of doctors. JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association. <clears throat> Huge number got together. The article said the effect of high dose omega-3 fatty acids, we don't know the brand, we don't know where they got it, we don't know it was purified, versus corn oil, <laughs> sorry, on major adverse cardiovascular events in patients at high cardiovascular risk. It's called the STRENGTH randomized clinical trial. STRENGTH. Okay. Effective omega-3 fatty acids versus corn oil on at-risk patients. You know, the study participants <clears throat> were on a statin drug and also received either omega-3 fatty acid or corn oil. You would be the only group of people who would snicker at that like I did. Corn oil. Cor they're heart doctors. Of course they're going to go on corn oil. Okay. Their conclusion? Among statin-treated patients at high cardiovascular risk, an addition of omega-3 fatty acid compared to corn oil to usual background therapies. I don't know what that means. Comparing... Omega-3 fatty acids compared with corn oil, each side, to usual background therapies resulted in no significant difference in a composite outcome of the major adverse cardiovascular events. These findings do not support the use of this omega-3 fatty acid formulation to reduce uh, major cardiovascular events in high-risk patients. They said something here I thought was cool, and I quoted this. These findings do not support the use of this omega-3. Which was it? Which one did you use? Now, I want to show you something that upset me. I've always wanted to do this, but I thought it's about time I do this. What were there, four doctors, you know, six doctors? John has the list of doctors up on the screen right now. Here is the list of doctors, 22, that published December 8th, 2020, in the Journal of the American Medical Association that, you know, stay on your statin, don't take these omega, don't take this omega-3 fatty acid. Why did they need 22 
doctors. And now, folks, at the end of every honest, and this was honest, at the end of every honest research paper is what we call a conflict of interest disclosure. I want you to take a look at the list of pharmaceutical companies that these 22 authors receive money from. Boom, there it is. And up at the top, a list of pharmaceutical companies that these 22 authors receive payments from. Now, the prime author, the number one author, uh, let's see if I got this, Dr. Somewhere in my notes I had this. I hope I still have it. Probably put it up here. I wanted to read you exactly, and I probably let it sit on my computer. I want to read you what the lead doctor, okay, here it is. Dr. Nichols, he's the lead author, reported receiving grants from AstraZeneca, Amgen, Anthera, Eli Lilly, Esperian, Novartis, Serenus, The Medicines Company, Resverlogix, Infraredex, Roach, Sanofi, Regeneron, Liposcience, and he receives personal money. In addition, those were grants. He receives personal money from AstraZeneca, Eli Lilly, Anthera, Omthera, Merck, Tadaka, Resverlogix, Sanofi, Regeneron, CSL Bering, Asperian, Bering Ingenheim during the time he was conducting this study. 24 pharmaceutical sources of income, some of which I'm sure I haven't studied, make statin drugs. How much money does this man receive? And is that disclosure enough? Does it represent a conflict of interest? Should he be disqualified? He shouldn't because the other 23 are what you see on the, I had to make that like four font or it wouldn't fit on the graphic. Is that okay? I'd like to know how you guys feel right now about throwing away your omega-3 fatty acid fish oils because these 24 doctors said, you know, you need our statin. You don't necessarily need corn oil, although we use corn oil every day in our salads, our wives cook with it. It's good and healthy. Um, but the omega-3 fatty acid doesn't, you know, doesn't uh, work. You see, there's two kinds of people in the world. Those who go to a doctor and admit trust. And those who try and avoid a doctor um, and worry about trust. This worries me. These 24 doctors were so in the pocket of companies that make statin drugs, how dare one of them step out? They're getting millions and millions collectively from drug companies to say that stat, to use statin drugs. Does anybody in this audience see a conflict of interest or is that okay with you? I thought I'd start with that when I have a couple of more and today's an hour and a half show, so that's good. Mm. Oh, that's so good. We continue with a story on prostatitis. This problem isn't going away. As a matter of fact, since I got involved in this 50 years ago, I didn't know what a prostate was 50 years ago. But uh, the longer I worked with doctors in clinical uh, nutrition, uh, the more I realized that, you guys, I saw 26-year-old men. I saw 32-year-old men, big, hairy, strong, muscular men who had sexual problems, who had erectile dysfunction. And then I began to turn over these studies as I was writing a book uh, on infertility with uh, Dr. Holland. He showed me some studies that talked about how mycotoxins could burst sperm cells. And I started thinking, wow, we've always thought infertility is a woman's problem. It's pro beer. It's probably a beer. It's a wrist problem. It's probably a beer problem, okay, uh, as much as anything else. But I need to keep this going because so many of you men and women want to know about prostate. Apparently, it's a very tender area. It's as you age and you hit your 50s. They say 8% of men, by the time they're 50 years old, wow, that's a lot of men. Say there's 170 million 
men in America, 10% would be 17 million. 14 million under 50? You know, by the time you're 50, you've got prostate problems. How many 60-year-olds? How many 70-year-olds? I bet the numbers are staggering have prostate problems. Now, prostatitis can be caused, and I'm quoting this from two studies that Dr. Curtis uh, provided me. Prostatitis and fungus. Prostatitis can be caused by chronic bacterial or fungal infections. How I wish I could find a urologist who knew that. Oh, bacteria, but fungus? Fungal prostatitis is especially common in older hospitalized, catheterized, immunosuppressed patients. Fungal prostatitis is commonly caused by candida species, two of them. And I've gone over this with you. One is candida albicans. Oh, by the by, the very yeast that inhabits the vaginal tract when women have a vaginal yeast infection and candida glabrata, two species of single-celled fungus. We call it yeast. Okay, so the most common, and I, this is in uh, this book also, <clears throat> Clinical Mycology. Um, it says the most common fungal infection, a ma uh, fungal prostate infection a male can have is candida albicans. And I'm thinking, wow, are we passing this back and forth? Shh, no. It's just unheard of in medicine. Okay, then I went on to say this, because there's some new information here. An Egyptian study, this was done in 2013, an Egyptian study reported that antifungal treatment may be extremely helpful for men with chronic prostatitis. Let me read you the overview of it. Men, if you have this, you, you uh, 1,000 consecutive male patients with chronic prostatitis, their average age, John, was 34. So some of them are 18, some are 29, some are 52. Some are 72. Average of 1,000 men with chronic prostatitis were treated for only two weeks. Do you remember I told you this story? When I started with Dr. Weekly and those other doctors, they asked me how long for psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, for granuloma annulari, for uh, eczema, how long do you put them on antifungal drugs, uh, Doug? And I, I said, well, let's try it for two weeks. Average 34 years were treated for two weeks with a low carbohydrate diet, brilliant, and the antifungal drug diflucan. Wait till we get to the results. Folks, if I'm a urologist and I'm watching this opening presentation, I'm thinking, okay, they'll show 6%, maybe 10. I'll never forget that study that was done on depression at Brown University where they uh, were talking about mold in dorms contributing to depression. And they said at the end of the study, I don't know, they, they studied a thousand kids, and when they moved them out of a mold environment, Brown University said, we couldn't believe it ourselves. We didn't know. But the majority of those kids, depression was uh, initiated by mold. And that's what they're saying here. Again, quote the study 2013, over 803 of those 1,000 men reported significant improvement in prostatitis symptoms. Successful treatment was also associated with a significant reduction in PSA levels. You know me in PSA, I don't buy it, never did, never did, and then I met the man that, wrote, that discovered it and wrote a book on it. He never bought it either, but somebody bought it, a monoclonal antibody company in Southern California bought it and convinced urologists the digital prostate exam a male does, a, 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 a urologist does on a male feeling the prostate is about 1%, 1.5% accurate. You got 100 men here and they all have prostate cancer. The finger is, where'd the finger graduate from medical school? The finger is going to find one or one and a half positives leaving 98 and a half men who are cancer positive without an accurate diagnosis. The FDA approved the PSA test based on it being twice or three times as accurate as the DRE, the digital rectal exam. So now we're up to almost 5%. And they put that test on the market decades ago 40, 50 years ago, and it's on the market today to diagnose men's prostate cancer 
and it doesn't. Here's the first problem, guys. Hello, urologist. Prostate-specific antigen, or prostate serum antigen, isn't prostate-specific. Pregnant women have high PSAs. It doesn't even have anything to do with the prostate, and yet a lot of men have lost their sexuality, have been chemically castrated, have lost their lives because a test that was very inaccurate is on the market today, but I digress. I just wanted you to know that, that we continue to find antifungal programs. Did they say the Kaufman diet, the Kaufman diet was one of the first, or the first, you know, 50 years on the market, but there are good antifungal diets out there. The men had to follow that, and they took Diflucan. Diflucan kills Candida glabrata and Candida albicans. Women know that. Now men need it too. I just I wanted to deposit that information. I want to talk a little bit about fungal balls. Ah, fungal balls inside the body. This was, uh, folks, we are finding growths, lumps, balls, um, and these people end up, uh, scans and x-rays, teach a doctor that these things, thanks John, teach a doctor that these growths, like polyps, uh, you know, are, are either benign or they're cancerous. Uh, fungal balls are benign, however, they could lead to something dangerous. So I admit it's a good idea to address them and try and shrink them. <clears throat> Candida albicans can occasionally cause fungal balls in the urinary system, which can cause severe problems such as urinary blockage. Anybody got that? High fever and septic infection. You're reinfecting yourself, says all these four research papers. <clears throat> Here's a couple of uh, examples. I pulled these out of the British Medical Journal of BMJ Oncology Letters, uh, Cancer Letters. Listen to these headlines. Post-surgical medial stinal, uh, after surgery, mediastinal aspergilloma masquerading as a malignancy post-surgical, after surgery. Prolapsed intraocular aspergilloma masquerading as a malignant melanoma. How many men and women are diagnosed with intraocular pressure differences or malignant melanoma of the eye? My mom was, and no doubt, they said it's malignant melanoma. You know the rest. Um, cranial aspergilloma masquerading as a meningioma. Cranial aspergillus and other fungi to protect themselves, Doug's hypotheses, grow in a sac that mimics a cancer. This is called an ascomycete or a mycetoma. They grow in a sac to prevent white blood cells from phagocytizing them, eating them. These white blood cells have very powerful digestive enzymes. They eat stuff inside your body, fungus, pathogenic bacteria, artifacts, you name it. They eat it up, they gobble it. But fungi have been here for a long time and they can outsmart the uh, white blood cell phagocytosis. One called histoplasmosis protects the fungus over the blood cell published. Matter of fact, I found that in a journal that I bought at a half-price bookstore many years ago, and I couldn't believe it. Histoplasmosis. Doesn't Doug think histo is COVID? Half of it's a virus, half of it's histo, bat poop? Mm -hmm. I do. And histo hides in the cells and protects the fungus over the human cell. Once again, when a fungal cell and a human cell coexist, only one can become dominant, the fungal cell. Okay? I mean, this is important information. So all of these sphenoid sinus, organi organized hematoma with cranial neuropathies masquerading as a malignancy, face cancer, not sinus cancer, over and over. So these, these fungal balls, so many people tell me, Doug, I have ovarian cysts, I have polyps. <clears throat> Uh, I have bumps and lumps, literally balls 
you know, growing under my arm. I don't know what they are. I go to the doctor, he x-rays them, and say, nah, they're, they're okay. They're just, and they can be just adipose. They can be, you know, lipomas, fatty tissues, fatty cysts. But if you have one of these that is resisting all treatments, could I suggest asking for Diflucan, Nystatin? What's always deleted, folks, because there's really no money in it, is the Kaufman diet. Those guys with prostatitis, man, doc, I'll do anything just to get relief. Um, I know people, uh, two of them, who are truck drivers who drive across country. One of them lives in California, and he's had prostate infections for years and years. He can't sit in a bouncing truck, uh, and his job is at stake. It hurts when a male has this infection. So the doctors gathered a thousand of them and said, I'm going to put you on uh, a drug called Diflucan. It's a one pill vaginal yeast cure. It was invented for AIDS patients. Um, but I'm going to put you on that eh, 150, 200 milligrams a day. And I want you to start a diet that eliminates grains, eliminates booze, you know, all the things we talk about here. Can you imagine their surprise in two weeks when 803 of this thousand high-fived them? I can. I had that go on all the time. I still get letters from you guys. I am one of the proudest people in the world that my work uh, is in its infancy at 50 years. This one I thought is, it grows these tails you know, hyphae, and they're capable of poking a hole through the intestine. Gut permeability or hyperpermeability exists. Little antigens of egg, you chew it up, or milk, began leaking through the gut. Somebody does food allergy testing. That was an area of my expertise many, many years ago. Uh, I think many people who have food allergy need to seal up the gut. And that's my takeaway from, you know, uh, uh, 10 years at least in that field. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about this. One of the most important human fungal pathogens is candida. It can be a good guy or a bad guy, which causes millions of skin and mucosal, mouth, vaginal, gut infections and life-threatening systemic infections every year. A lot of people die of candida infections. Recently, recently, and I want to go back to 2016. That must have been an epic year. 2016 was the year that they repurposed Spornox, and nobody questioned it. Shh. Not one of these 190 IQ guys went home and said, honey, you're not gonna believe this. Uh, Spornox kills fungus. Yeah, I know. It's been on the market for years. Yeah, I know. It's now been repurposed as a cancer drug. Not one of them, not one of them said, you gotta be kidding me. Is cancer a fungus? What an illogical question. Of course not. I'm a doctor. I know better than that. Then what is cancer? Uh, we don't know. And yet an antifungal, folks, there's a lot of them now. Griziofulvin. griziofulvin has been published to help with cancer. Um, Lamacil, terbenafin, has been published. So here we go. We have Candida albicans. It secretes a cytolytic uh, that means cytolytic, um, that's the process whereby a cell osmotically becomes hyperpressurized and bursts. Cytolytic. Um, it, it produces a cytolytic peptide. A peptide is 2 to 50 amino acids gathered together, chained together. It's a toxin called candida lysin. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, candida lysin. So I, I begin to study this. I've never heard of candida lysin. 2016, the year that Sporanox was repurposed, the name candida, candida lysin, L-Y-S-I-N, first came up. Brand new to me. Didn't know anything about it. Although I believe it behaves like a mycotoxin, it's involved in the induction of cirrhosis and liver cancer. Candida lysin is considered an exotoxin. So I looked that up. I remember learning that in school. Exotoxins aren't mycotoxins. There's a difference. Let me teach you what they are. An exotoxin is secreted. It's a poison secreted by bacteria. A mycotoxin 
is a poison secreted by fungus. So you have exotoxins and you have mycotoxins. And I'm telling you this, there's a somatic lesson here that I want you to learn. I'm telling you this because we must rely on science. 2019, this candid lysin, uh, candida lysin has been accepted. It's an exotoxin. This article in the Journal of the Infectious Disease, Volume 220, Issue 9, November 1, 2019, said this, Candida lysin seems to play a role, a key role, in neutrophil recruitment, so the white blood cells gather, and fungal virulence during dissemination in systemic candida albicans infections. So, it's a mycotoxin. No, no, it's, a, it, it, it's an exotoxin. But didn't the paper study candida? The original paper studied candida. Current Opinions in Microbiology, uh, Volume 52, December 2019, pages 100 to 109. Recently it was discovered that the invasive hyphal form of candida albican secretes a cytolytic peptide toxin named candida lysin. Bacteria produce poisons. They secrete poisons called exotoxins. But candida secretes toxins called a mycotoxin. This is the science you and I sit down and rely on every day. Look, mistakes happen and I don't know everything. Maybe there's a brand, maybe they're trying to underlie fungal mycotoxins and give them new names. You never know, folks. Just depends on how many doctors you pay to write the paper. Okay? I saw this funny thing on uh, Facebook. Four out of five doctors uh, rely on drug companies to publish, uh, you know, they work for the drug companies, and what the drug companies need to have is a favorable opinion. Do you think that is existing? Do you think what you, your dad and mom would have called cheating in medical science is going on? I'd love to hear from you. Now, I came here today to read this, and then uh, I'm going to take a little break. Next week, I won't be back Tuesday and Wednesday, but if John and Damon are all right with it, uh, Thursday and Friday morning, I can do Thursday an hour and Friday maybe an hour and a half. Watch, they're both sitting back there going, no, no, no. Let's do it. Good. Thank you, John. Ah, wow, look at you guys. Yes, Vincent. Wow. Okay, uh, Bill. Are statin drugs safe to stop immediately or should they be gradually eased back? The brilliance, the brilliance of chemical companies is their ability not to convince doctors um, that they need to market their wares, but to make it very difficult physiologically for a patient to stop their wares. For example, you don't stop selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, depression medicines. You wouldn't stop Coumadin. You know, you don't stop autoimmune disease drugs. Uh, statin drugs, one of their properties, as every doc, no, it's not true, as you and I know, is their antifungal. So you use a base and then you add bases or acids to the solution to come up with a proprietary invention, a proprietary invention, a patentable drug. And then you get detail people out of college, give them a white Chevrolet, and they go out and drive around the neighborhoods and give free samples to doctors, okay? That's okay. Um, I wouldn't just stop something that is so absorbed into your bloodstream. If you want to stop any medication, talk to your doctor, it's spelled T-I-T-E-R. Talk to your doctor about titering down the medication. I don't know how statin drugs are taken, uh, but if they're taken uh, once a day, 10 milligram, ask your doctor if you can take 10 milligrams every other day or pop them in half, five milligrams, you know, a day. Uh, and then maybe go one every third day. I'm not telling you how, I'm not telling you to do this. I'm telling you a conversation you should share with your doctor if you want off a medication, any medication. You guys, when I was working, with these doctors 30 some years ago, 1986, so wow, 35 years ago, I am old. 
and some of you were patients of theirs. It, it's so great we were, we're together 35 years later. Um, so here's what used to happen. There would be people, and I worked in LA in this field also, but never had anything like this happen. These people would come back in two weeks, and I'll never forget David's face. I'll never forget it. We had a woman come in who uh, had psoriasis, and I mean it was bad, all over her back, shoulders, knees, uh, you know, all over her body. And uh, we started her on. David said, I'm not going to give you a cortisone shot today. I'm not going to have you stand in the UV light box. Rather, Doug's going to talk to you. And he said, you know, let's try it. It seems to be working well. Diflucan, Nystatin, and Kaufman's diet. Um, and so I did that. <laughs> so two weeks when she came back, and man, she was so excited. She was so excited. And she was, she thought all better, probably 60, 70 percent improved without the cortisone. She'd been on that for years without the UV light, right? Just following along this diet. And uh, she said, David always looked to me with this great grin. When he got it, it takes a doctor, especially a higher, you know, Johns Hopkins, it took him two or three months before he got it, before he got it, before he smiled at me. Uh, well, this patient said to him, here's the good news. He said, no, no, we don't have to give you a cortisone shot. And she said, you know, I've quit all my medications. You could have heard a pin drop in that room. Oh, no. You, did you quit your heart? Yeah, quit everything. Why? Look, I've been on medicines for years and years. Look, I, see, I don't want you to do that because drug companies, I'm not sure they know this. They're not that nefarious. Um, once your physiochemistry changes and you become bits of statin, bits of cortisone, bits of antibiotic, you don't just stop because it can have a detrimental effect on your health. Um, you begin titering down. And that bill is what I would tell my doctor. I can't recommend that, uh, but that's what I would do if I wanted off a drug. Do not stop like she did. Carolyn, acid reflux, help. How I wish we knew and how I wish medicine accentuated the cause instead of the pill. Acid reflux, there are acid blockers if I could find Marty's book. Gosh, I love this book. I read it one of the last times I took an airplane ride, probably four or five years ago. It's called, oh, that's her thing. Uh, getting off statin, Zoloft, Prozac, getting off acid blocking medication. Marty Whitkin is a certified clinical nutritionist, a friend of mine. He's written a couple of books and they're really, really good. A uh, little book costs $7. But acid blockers, competition for acid blockers, basically. Acid blockers came on the market, the purple pill, you remember the ads, and purportedly they were supposed to be taken a few weeks or a month. People are living on them long term. And there are some complications from doing that. Um, what is the cause, folks, why? Why would acid, I'll never forget the ad, the guy sitting in the motel room on the bed with a pizza at 9 o'clock p.m. and he says, I can't believe I ate the whole thing. And he's got, you know, GERD, gastroesophageal reflux, acid coming back up. Um, I'm really blessed that's never happened to me, but I know it happens to a lot of people. First rule is you're done with dinner at 5 p.m. It's like you're old. You know, you're done. Not starting. You're done with dinner at 5 p.m and you drink some water, you know, before you go to bed. Second rule is, why does this go this way? Why is it, why are you, are you regurgitating hydrochloric or, or acids? Why is that coming back up? Therein lies the, the pill. Blocking that acid stops that from happening. And folks, we are so compliant. We patients are amazing. You never ask the doctor why. Why does he do? Well, we don't know. But take this pill for how long? Rest of your life. If I had acid reflux, I would think about gut hyperpermeability, so I would take L-glutamine. L-glutamine is in a white powder. 
uh, Guy's company has it, um, glutamic acid. Um, look at uh, life extension. Um, I would begin taking a probiotic. You know me, I'm glued to the hip 20 years to Dr. O'Hara's probiotics. That's the one I take. I either take RegActive, which I'm on right now, or Dr. O'Hara's probiotic, a living bacteria, a living bacteria. Um, I would begin using psyllium every other night, make sure the bowel moves often. But most importantly, I'd stop feeding, we talk about feeding fungus, I'd stop feeding that acid. I'd stop feeding uh, gr sugars, carbo excess carbohydrates. Uh, I'd cut way back on the carbohydrates and look at getting protein from things like cashew nuts and, and almonds and walnuts and, uh, and uh, meats and eggs, you know, uh, things of that sort and kind of follow along a Kaufman One diet. What I ask every one of you to do, and Carolyn, you're no exception, is to consider experimenting. Only when you go to an acid reflux doctor, he's got one piece of the puzzle, take this, and you'll think he hung the moon. Because the next night, you're not burping, you're not, you're sleeping through the night. He gave you the magic wand. Read a little bit about what the magic wand can do long term. And, uh, and then look for alternatives. Change your diet, coat the intestines, which I believe L-glutamine can help with. Uh, become proactive, begin taking supplements. Uh, Beta-glucan, I think every person watching this show, and you know it's free, you get that 10 or 20 pack free just by calling them. I think everybody ought to be concerned right now about their immune system. Um, and so I, I hope that helps. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always rely on an acid blocker or a statin drug or an antihypertensive drug or a diabetes shot. And maybe there's a genetic, uh, maybe this is a, a familial disease and maybe that should be. Don't let me be the one to tell you to get off. Absorb what I say uh, and sometimes it'll help. Uh, what about so much fish contamination? Yeah. Oh boy. Berkeley, my little seven year old. Gosh, he's. Uh, John, did you. Uh, uh, Rex, has this happened to you yet, John or Joy, your wife? Um, Rex asked Ruth if she was a girl. <laughs> it's the cutest thing. The innocence of these kids. Hey, Nana. Um, are you a girl? You just want to squeeze them. They absorb, they learn. Oh, um, wow. Berkeley watched, we were in Fredericksburg, Texas at an Airbnb and we watched a documentary on uh, just the slaughtering of fish. Look, I, I eat fish, um, but this was inhumane. It was done by other countries, and it's a regular thing. Um, the oceans, folks, I, I, I'm not a Greenpeace guy. The oceans are so horribly contaminated that some people consider a good option, the ocean, therefore the lakes, the rivers, the tributaries, a good option is eating farm-raised fish. And so that's widely available. Most stores, it looks like tuna, but it's not. It looks like salmon, but it's not. It was raised in a big bowl out on some farm somewhere. Um, it, it's really, um, along with cleaning up the globe, I really believe that oceans, it, it's unbelievable, unbelievable. Uh, so what about fish contamination? Uh, there are contaminants. Uh, you know, everything arguably has contaminants in it. That's why we take the psyllium that binds contaminants from our intestines. That's why we use wheatgrass juice. Uh, that's why we use chlorophyll. Um, that's why we drink a lot of water to urinate things out. But you bring up a really good point, Cindy. Um, the oceans are horribly, horribly contaminated. 
Ganglion cysts inside hand, right thumb. Had one long ago, same wrist, operated on any suggestions. Well, you're going to think this is a little crazy, Virginia, but um, in the military, we were, had gone through school, our training, our medical training. Once a hospital corpsman goes through his medical training, then he has to go to the Marine Corps out in uh, Camp Pendleton, California, and go through you know, learning to shoot a gun um, and all of that. While we were going through that, we used to play baseball. It wasn't like boot camp, we were free. The Marines loved us because we were corpsmen, we were their medical aid. And so the Marines versus the Navy, we get a baseball game going. And uh, the center fielder on our team, gosh, uh, you know, he was an amazing catch, just amazing catches he would make. But he grew this thing right here on his, you know, on his hand that turned out the doctor, Lipman, L-I-P-M-A-N, Dr. Lipman, diagnosed was a ganglion cyst. And then Dr. Lipman did something amazing. He, you know where I'm going with this job? He took out a thick book off his shelf. I'm standing there with him. And he goes, now lay your hand down flat. And he goes, wham! And this poor guy jumps, gone, gone. For the two years I knew him, we both went to Vietnam, uh, for the two years I knew him, no ganglion. Are you that brave? I mean, I'd talk to the, before you go back and, did, did you ever have that happen, John? No, uh, I think somebody on Facebook. They've got to be dealt with either surgically or benign, you know, just kind of live with it. Or um, you might do some research on that. Thank you for writing in. Any idea how to get rid of hives that I have been dealing with for five months? I'm not allergic to anything. Um, we, we call hives in, in dermatologic medicine, and I went through a few months before I fully comprehended what David and the doctors were telling patients. We call it urticaria. You can never say hives, just like, doctor, there seems to be swelling around my heart. Oh, you have inflammation. There's always a, a legal and a medical term for everything that we normal people, you know, uh, the words we use. So urticaria, um, I have, um, one memorable case that I remember, uh, Jerry Jones is the guy that owns the, uh, what's that oblong ball, John? Football. football. Um, he owns a, a football team out here called the Dallas Mavericks or something, uh, Cowboys. And uh, he had a friend who uh, was a friend of the doctors. And she came in and uh, she, her, her primary concern was hives. And we didn't know how bad they were. David told her, she said heat exacerbates them. So he said, they're not very noticeable right now. Would you do it? She lived right down the road in the expensive homes out here in Dallas. And uh, so uh, he said, if it gets bad, come back in. Well, after lunch one day, uh, she was there in the waiting room and she showed us, and I'm telling you, she looked spotted, just red burning things on her body. Okay, so we were lost. What do you do for urticaria, hives? And you've probably been through this, a cortisone shot. You think the doctor's magic. And uh, for a few days, they'll stay away. Then they'll come back, often with vengeance. Uh, and this was what's happening to her. So, um, I asked David if I could at least try the diet and nystatin, and he said, sure, you know, what, what do we got to lose? We saw her in two weeks. She was traveling a lot. She lived also out of the country. She was traveling a lot, and she came back in two weeks, and she was so excited, carefully excited, not overly excited like some of the patients got. Well, years later, David passed, <clears throat> And years later, my wife and I were at Whole Foods Market out here in Dallas. And, uh, you know, I was carrying the basket and I feel this tap on my shoulder and I turn around and, and she said, Doug Kaufman. And I said her name. And we gave each other a hug. And uh, she said, you know, you cured me of my hives. She stayed on Nystatin. David died. And, she stayed on Nystatin for three years. The pharmacist kept filling it. No hives now. 
to the extent that hives may have been fungally driven, it fixed it. Um, but I don't recall a lot of patients seeing David or the other doctors because of hives specifically. The one case I got to follow up on was thanks to a health food store out in Dallas. I saw her five, six, maybe seven years later, and the hives were gone. So that made me feel good, and I hope that helps you. Now, <clears throat> would I take Nystatin? Uh, one case does not a book make, um, but it's certainly worth asking yourself, have I been exposed to fungus? How would I be exposed to fungus? Folks, cigarettes, if you've ever smoked cigarettes, loaded with several different species of fungus. Have you lived in an old home? Do you just sand down old antique floors or furniture? Uh, do you sleep with a pillow that's two or three years old? All these are ways we expose ourselves to mold. Thinking that way, now, uh, cookie, is it, is it likely that you were exposed at some time to mold? Then should you try resveratrol capsules, um, caprylic acid? I love caprylic acid, a medium chain fatty acid from coconut. A very powerful antimicrobial activity in caprylic acid. Should you do that for a month and see if gradually these things dissipate? That's what I would do. Great questions, thank you so, so much. I'm hoping all of this makes sense to you guys. I'm, I am excited to go see my son and his wife uh, I think she is six months pregnant now. We're going to have a Christmas little girl. And I just haven't traveled. My wife and I have not traveled. And um, I find myself not really too concerned. I'm certainly not worried about, you know, the uh, virus. I'm just worried about behavior, I think. Uh, I'm going to wear a mask. You have to. You have to fill out, if you're going into California, you've got to fill out all this paperwork, you've got to test yourself. Um, but to see that boy, totally worth it to me. I'm going to humble myself a little bit. By the time that, plane's land, uh, that plane lands back in Dallas next week, um, it, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be uh, very, very happy. My goal, I hope he's not listening to this, my goal is to do with he and his wife what we successfully did with my oldest son and his wife and their baby, and that is get them back to Texas. They were born, both of them, in California. Uh, and uh, then I took a job offer from David in 1986. Wow, they were one and three or four years old then. And we've been here since, so the, all they knew was Texas, but. Um, they both went back to the beach. They both love their roots, and I can't wait to, to see him and his wife and their home. I haven't seen their home. I haven't seen his studio. He's a studio musician. He produces, he publishes and produces music. He does quite well. I'm very proud of him. Um, okay, so here's my buddy, Ann. I love hearing from Ann. Hey, Doug and John, hope all is well with you and your families. It is. Doug, it seems so many people seem to have leaky gut. Is this all due to diet, as always, keeping you guys and your families in prayer? We feel it, Ann. Thank you. Um, why are we seeing virtually an explosion of gut hyperpermeability? I don't think we are. Um, I think it's been around for a long, long time. Uh, folks, they're saying that the reason we're seeing huge fungal infections like mucor in India and histo and well, aspergillus here with COVID uh, is because of uh, climate change. Uh, I think we've had fungal problems pretty much forever. Matter of fact, there's this book on about page 133. It said, the Lord told Moses and Aaron, when you go into Canaan, this land I'm giving you, if you see a spreading mildew, fungus in a house in that land, you got to move out. You got to burn your clothes if they got it. You got to get healthy if you get it on your skin. It's been around a long time. I don't, I can't remember the Bible referencing climate change, but um, that's what they're saying now. I think the most important thing I can teach today is your body is not static. 
If you take your blood pressure now and in five minutes, it's likely to be different. If you took it tomorrow, much different, depending on some variables, stress, diet, etc. Medical science is not what you and I tend to think is science. Am I to believe the science of 1960? Am I to believe the science of 2021? Or am I to believe the science of 20, you know, 71? Because we are going to advance it. It changes daily. We just found an endotoxin, a bacterial toxin, that purportedly comes from candida. Science changes every hour. What science do you want me to trust? It's changing all the time. Gut permeability, I don't think was around as heavily as it is today. I think uh, we have beautified booze and drugs. Uh, I think many drugs, including antibiotics, are very hard on the gut. Um, and we didn't have them 70 years ago. Gut hyperpermeability is when, uh, they're, they're called invaginations, they're little uh, pockets in the intestine that begin to spring open and they allow antigenically intact food macromolecules, egg, wheat, corn, milk, to leak through. Well, anything that leaks out through an opening then gains access to the bloodstream, right? Um, and they feed, if you have a systemic fungus, they feed the systemic fungus. But more importantly, what we're doing today is drawing a tube of blood. I'm responsible for this. We're drawing a tube of blood using the blood serum where the B cell antibodies are, and we're finding food allergy. Gee, you got 85 food allergies. Do I, or do I have gut permeability that you need to spackle up? Now, don't eat spackle. Uh, but you need to look at things like probiotics and glutamine and, and um, you know, psyllium and some of those things that help seal up a leaky gut. And it is a growing problem because our medical communities aren't aware the methotrexate, the hormones, the things we're telling people to swallow may have a permeability effect on the lumen, the lining of the gut. Good question, and thank you for your prayers. Uh, Joan says, my own doctor told me fish oil uh, didn't do any good for anything. I ignored her. She has given me bad information five, time, <laughs> five times now. I won't be seeing her again. By the way, is it called Lavasa? When, when they hit the billion dollar mark, when omega-3 fatty acids, which I like, when they hit the billion dollar range, the drug companies developed a medical um, form. Uh, I think it's called Lavasa. And so doctor, oh gosh. <laughs> uh, and it was on the, it's been on the market. I don't know if it's still on the market. Lavasa, I think it's called. It's like Olestra, the fat, you know, potato chips with Olestra in it. Don't get me started. So. This Lavasa, um, a doctor could now prescribe omega-3 fatty acids. That's the goal. So a doctor could prescribe it, your insurance would pay for it, and so forth. Um, it, it boils down, Joan, to whom do you trust? Do you, do you trust health food brands that do their due diligence and spend their money and come up with great products? Or do you trust a pharmaceutical company? That's all. Um, good, uh, good for you. So Joan's shopping for a doctor, John. Wow, Dorothy. On the Kaufman diet, I've been off insulin for seven months now. Uh, so if I'm an endocrinologist and you told me you stopped insulin seven months ago, I would have known you had diabetes. But since the beta, pancreatic beta cells self-fixed by stopping feeding them, did you have diabetes or did you have a fungal condition? You can't cure cancer with an antifungal program. 
So is this all cancer? You can't fix diabetes, blood sugar fluctuations, and more um, on the Kaufman program. But if it's fungus mimicking diabetes or mimicking cancer, as you learned in the opening today, then it can be fixed. Wow, thank you so much, Dorothy. You don't know how many people you help when you give testimonies like this. We have a lot of them. Yeah, and Paul, the reason they've referred you uh, to hematology and oncology, they're now looking for the swollen lymph nodes. They're wondering if you have a, a, a lymph cancer or a type of blood cancer. Uh, splenectomy, wow. Uh, this, could this have a fungal connection? Uh, I don't know any more than I knew Dorothy didn't have diabetes. You just learned a minute ago that food, medications, fungus, pathogenic yeast can exit the gut and get into the bloodstream where they're met with B cells making an antibody to them. Okay, If there's an over influx, you're taxing your immune system. So busy making antibodies to corn, wheat, and milk that you can't protect against cancer. If I were you and you're worried about a uh, a, a lymph or a blood cell cancer. I have some experience with this. I'd be on this program tomorrow. I'd get our diet guide. I'd read the list of shopping, you know, go to the store and get these foods. I would juice, let's see, I would juice with vitamin A, carrots, you know, chlorophyll, and I used to get that with Italian parsley I put in it. I'd put a half a clove of garlic in it. Uh, I used to use a half a cucumber, celery, and the first few times decades ago, woo, that didn't taste very good. And then I got used to doing it immediately after a jog. I used to jog three or four miles, and uh, man, was it refreshing. I don't know, Paul. I'm not God, um, but I would sure talk to him about this, and I would sure change. I would ask my doctor, look. I know you've referred me to hematology and oncology, and I know what you're telling me. This isn't good. Can I take a month? And I'm telling you, um, I would consult a naturopathic doctor somewhere in your area, and uh, I, would, uh, I would begin studying the fungal, go to pubmed.org, and begin studying how fungus can alter human blood cells and mimic very serious diseases. I'm so sorry, but I'm so happy you're here today. <clears throat> uh, Beth, my buddy Beth. Wow, Doug, I'm now facing a visit uh, back to my doctor to discuss my high cholesterol, and I'm sure that she will want me back on a statin. I'm taking omega-3 fish oil to see what it will do, reduce it or more. Even went back to eating oatmeal, which I'm not fond of to help. <laughs> Thank you for your wisdom. Okay. If I, okay, Beth, I have been cellophane. My cholesterol when I was younger was up to 250, 255. It's now, a friend of mine is a doctor who drew my blood a couple of years ago, and he told me, gosh, you have a high cholesterol short of that. You're not a methylator. You don't got a prostate problem. You know, your cholesterol, your cholesterol is the only thing atypical or abnormal. And it, as I recall, it's like 230. Um, if I had a doctor and went to him, he or she would be duty bound to prescribe a medication. I'm bad this way, I study these things. And for me, calf soreness, tears of muscle, it's just not in my future. I worry about side effects of everything, medicine. And I'm hoping that my lifestyle will contribute to my staying away from doctors and hospitals for a few more years. Eventually, I'm, I am aging. I am deteriorating. Eventually, I've got to seek counsel of someone. John and I always ask, who would we go to? Um, you know, if something happened to us. But your doctor is right. She lives by the guidelines set by the pharmaceutical 
and the American Medical Associations, in unison of course, to get patients on drugs. These statins, I read a paper to you guys three years ago, how do they reach all the way back there? How can they pat themselves? They are in love with statin drugs. By the by, they were in double love 70 years ago with Camel cigarettes. As a matter of fact, four out of five doctors smoked them. 30 years ago, they were in triple love with uh, hormone replacement therapy, HRT. Why? It was going to prevent moodiness, it was going to prevent strokes, it was going to prevent breast cancer, and lo and behold, strokes increased on them. Whoops! And now they're in love with statin drugs. They're trend followers. They learn from the pharmaceutical industry. It's called continuing medical education. They got to take it. Who gives it? The pharmaceutical. Do you think it's coinkadinky, folks? So Beth, um, if I was concerned about hypercholesteremia, I would, I would take, and I told you I'm taking, uh, I, I'm taking Life Extension. Love that company. I'm taking their omega-3 fatty acid. Um, I would take niacin, uh, uh, vitamin B3. Here it is. Every year or two, I get out Dan Mowry. I don't know anything about Dan Mowry. John, I can't see here, but do you have this camera on? Okay, can you see that book? Okay, good. Um, this is one of my all-time favorite herb books, The Scientific Validation of Herbal Medicine. Wow, I paid $5 for this. Um, it's an older book. Let's see when Dan Mowry publishes. I've never talked to him. I bet I've sold more of his books than anybody. 1986, man, the year I came out here. Um, Saul Pimento, like garlic, can be used for several things. In herbal medicine, we find the root. This is an ant olive leaf, an antimicrobial. That means microbes are germs, and it doesn't care whether you have a bacterial, a protozoal, a virus, a fungal infection. Olive leaf seems to pretty much work that way. Saw pimento has been very reliable through the years to help men with prostate problems. Okay, just like dong quai, uh, women who are going through menopause seems to help them. Uh, dong quai also helps establish a, a 28-day menses. And dong quai was a dong quai at one time was a pharmaceutical medication back in the 50s or 60s that was given out for uh, uh, amenorrhea, uh, no menstrual period, and it restarted the, you know. So a lot of these, Kim, good for you, thank you, very valuable. A lot of these things have many purposes. When you find out their, their basis, if it's antifungal, I'm all for it. <clears throat> so Scott says, I saw a doctor online saying that we are deficient in potassium, I think he's right, and wheatgrass juice powder is a superior form of uh, potassium. Do you have an issue with wheatgrass? No, as you do with wheat the grain. No, no, no. Uh, wheatgrass is premature uh, sprouting grass. Um, Scott, call, call Brightcore. This is their product, uh, Brightcore. They're advertisers. They were with me 10, 15 years, 20 years ago. Uh, when I, 22 years ago, when I first started, she was one of my first advertisers. And then their business flourished, grew, they added 20 new products, they have beets, you know, organic beets, which increase the nitric acid burst. Um, it, so many good products. This is wheatgrass juice, not wheatgrass, wheatgrass juice. They have a little scoop in there, add it to water in the morning, uh, which I'm currently doing. Uh, nothing like it. Thank you, Scott. Great question. <clears throat> nothing more. <laughs> Jay London. Nothing more antifungal than turpentine. Yeah. John, you challenged me the other day, and I thought that was really fascinating with your, was it a strychnine or what did you, what did you, arsenic. Mm-hmm. And what was the analogy? I, I think the analogy is today, folks, in science, there's a lot of us scared. So John came up with this at lunch. Get a glass of water 
and take arsenic, a poison, would you drink a glass of water with one drop of, um, yeah, probably, because it's uh, 70 cc's. Would you drink a glass of water with six drops? Mm, no, I think that would be, what does science say about arsenic? You know, in homeopathy, um, what do they use? It's some kind of noxious material in homeopathic remedies that is the base for many of them. And killing off inside your body is a good thing. Antifungals, antibacterials, et cetera, are good things. But I digress. I'm going far too long. Thank you. Uh, that's so true. I have reactivated Epstein-Barr. How can I get this under control? <clears throat> Kira, um, Epstein-Barr used to be called mononucleosis. When you and I, or I don't know you, but when I was a kid, um, we passed mononucleosis back and forth like the common cold. It was characterized by just totally falling asleep, couldn't get going in the morning, couldn't eat, etc. So doctors Epstein and Barr must have lunch one day. We don't like that name mononucleosis, one nucleus, right? Um, let's call it, hey, Epstein-Barr. It'd be like Miller-Kaufman syndrome. Miller-Kaufman syndrome is excellent health, okay? Epstein-Barr is uh, mononucleosis. It's recurring for a reason. Remember when I did the, and I brought this to you several times, I've done it on TV several times. Here's what we know, guys. We know that human papillomavirus becomes more virulent and surfaces and can initiate a pattern that is deadly when a mycotoxin called aflatoxin made by aspergillus is added to the equation. So when a, <clears throat> excuse me, a woman with, um, with uh, a human papillomavirus begins eating a lot of corn with aspergillus in it or eating peanuts with aspergillus, this uh, mycotoxin made by aspergillus will surface and may kill her. Same with AIDS. Same with human immunovirus. Well, Epstein-Barr is a virus. Doctor, why does my human papillomavirus keep concerning you? Why does the titer keep going up? Uh, why is my AIDS not under control sometimes? Why am I recurring with Epstein-Barr? Now, I'm using that for education purposes only, but I gotta tell you, the work's been done on human papilloma. It's been done on AIDS. There's a mycotoxin that makes them more virulent and more deadly. What activates them? A fungal mycotoxin. Most of the cases of AIDS are in uh, Africa, sub-Sahara, where their diet is corn and peanuts. So the point I want to make, Kira, is I would begin looking at this as though there may be, talk to your doctor about this, there may be an underlying fungal pathology here. Um, you know, once again, do you have yeast problems, mold problems, etc.? Uh, if you do, try my diet for a month. You can get titers done. You can go to the, uh, a lab and um, a Life Extension works with any lab in your city, any lab throughout the United States. They've got a contract with these, the biggest lab. And you go down there and you give a tube of blood and they can tell you what your titer, IgG, probably IgM titer, to Epstein-Barr is. And then follow the Kaufman program, maybe take some resveratrol, take a little D3 every day, beta glucan, go back in a month, see if the titer's down. Okay? Hope that helps. Uh, Bill says, thank you, John. I like the hour and a half better. I just get going on the hour. You know what I'd like to do? Damon's, Damon's probably in there saying, no, shut him up. I'd like to do a daily. Once we launch on our own platform, I would like to do a daily show. And I would do, John, I promise you and Damon, I do 10 or 15 minutes monologue followed by just answering questions. And I think I could get 15 or 20. The fact that we get so many people joining this shows there's a void. They did want to know what time next week in the morning. Were you looking at 10 o'clock maybe? I'm thinking 10, John, because we're in Dallas. We're kind of in the middle. So that would be what, 9? And yeah, so kids are off to school. Yeah, yeah. so uh, good. Now, let's make it 10 if Damon's okay with that. 
Uh, Scott said, I saw a doctor online saying we are deficient. Oh, we already did that. Thank you, Scott. You're right. Bill says, self-care is time-consuming and can be pricey at times. I learned that too, Bill. But the dividends are amazing. Bill has learned, I fought with myself for so long. What's wrong with a beer? They wouldn't sell it if it wasn't FDA approved. I looked at alcohol as though it were FDA approved. Is it ironic that the food approvals in America are also the drug approvers in America? And the industry, the food and pharmaceutical industry, apparently three quarters of, half to three quarters of their entire budget is paid for by the food and by the drug industry. Why don't we have a food administration? And these people would be concerned about health. If you're a food and drug, hey, if they eat poorly, too much fat, too many mycotoxins, they'll get sick. Drugs, we're the FDA. You know where I'm going with that. Thank you, Bill. Important information. <clears throat> Keeley asks, is there a mycotoxin that can cause thyroid cancer? God bless you guys. He does Keeley with friends like you. We don't know. We don't know. This book, Clinical Mycology, Principles and Practice of Clinical Mycology, circa 25 years ago, said fungus can grow anywhere in the human body, thyroid, parathyroid, except the teeth. Can't breach the enamel of the teeth. I don't know if that's correct, but 25 years ago they thought that. Thyroid cancer. What could have gotten through the gut, into my bloodstream, taken up harbor or residence in my thyroid, and then grown as long as I fed it? Nobody can tell you that. Mm. Ah, uh, da, 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 da. Tom says, hey, I'm joining late. Do you recommend taking Prevagen on a regular basis or another brand for sharp memory? Uh, they're not advertisers, so there's no bias here. To know Mark and Cody and the whole team over there at Prevagen, to see their research was unbelievable. My company, Know the Cause, launched Prevagen maybe 10 years ago. Uh, I love the guys. I love the product. I still recommend it. I have seen phosphatidylserine, PS we call it, phosphatidyl or phosphatidylserine, uh, also work quite well for memory. The two I think would really be good, but I still love uh, Prevagen. Um, yeah, so uh, soybeans. Any thoughts on natokinase instead of blood thinners? Not blood thinners, I used to take bromelain every other morning, and then I'd take natokinase enzyme uh, every other morning, but I never studied it as soybean as though it's a, a, a blood thinning agent. Uh, so I'm sorry, Marilyn, I don't really know the answer to that. Uh, Ricky says, my brother is on chemo meds. He's got no appetite, bad diarrhea. Any advice from anyone would be helpful. Thank you all. Some of you have loved ones who have been here. Um, Brother is on chemo meds. The purpose of chemo meds, Ricky, and I'm sure you know this, maybe you don't want to hear it. The goal of chemotherapy is to defeat the cancer before the medication defeats the patient. I wish we could discern where chemotherapy went into that nodule in my left breast, into the right side of my prostate, you send it into the bloodstream. Boy, I'd sure talk with, uh, I, I'd get feedback from a good naturopathic doctor. So sorry. Monica says, could you, uh, oh, what time Thursday and Friday? 10 o'clock. Let's do 10 a.m. next Thursday, a week from tomorrow, and 10 a.m. Friday, if that works with Damon's schedule. Could you please explain the Myers cocktail? You mentioned this a lot. What is it? Um, so Dr. Myers, I think he was from Florida, uh, and that's only because there's a Fort Myers, he may not be from there, uh, taught us how to infuse a cocktail that would help with immunity. Basically, one of you asked the questions today, um, you know, Doug, how come we're seeing so much gut permeability these days? I think one thing we Americans, I think globally, we're all suffering from is a vitaminosis. A mineralosis. I think, I think we eat properly, 
but there's such a thick black barrier in our intestines that the food isn't absorbed or the minerals aren't absorbed through there. So this guy Myers years ago said, I got an idea, if we put the B vitamins, I remember we used to buy this. Uh, this is another thing I brought to Dr. Weekly. I went to a symposium, I learned about this, I took it home, and I said, uh, you now have general practitioners, could we begin seeing uh, HIV positive patients? They need an immune system developed. And so he said, yes, vitamin C, a lot of it, B vitamins, manganese, magnesium, uh, et cetera, went into uh, what is the Myers cocktail. You can go online and, and uh, look at that. <clears throat> Uh, Patricia says, how are you not concerned about getting COVID? First of all, I don't spend any time on it. Uh, second of all, I had it. Almost two years ago now, John and I had it just back to back. Um, and I need to walk down this aisle with you guys. The science of a year ago said, that's not going to help. A year ago, the science says it is going to help. Probably most helpful. Um, I don't live my life in fear. Darn it, I spent a year in Vietnam. And I'm telling you, there were times I was so scared, I almost let it fly. There are things that happen that you're so, you can't believe this stuff is happening. I resolved in 1971 when I got home, I am never living my life in fear. This fear ain't working on Kaufman. If I get it again, I've had it once, okay, and I recovered at 70 years old. Ta-da, okay? Uh, I have a fungal infection under my left big toe. What can I do to improve it? This became a problem after hip surgery and Moderna. Any suggestions? I would use something topically. I'd probably go light initially uh, with tea tree oil, melaleuca plant, topically. You can buy it in a health food store. I might use a clove oil, oregano oil, rosemary, uh, thyme. Um, in other words, for a month or two, I just apply a little bit, maybe sleep with a sock on, a cotton sock, uh, and uh, for a month or two, and, and see if that, uh, if that helps it. I, I don't know what else to tell you. Get back with us, Kathleen, and let us know if it helps. I don't know what this is. Maybe uh, Krista can help me. My dear friend is having horrible reaction to cadaver parts, oh, in her arm. Docs just keep putting her on steroids, see pictures. I, uh, so, cadaver. So in other words, she's had some surgery and she, they've used uh, replaced bone or, or tissue, whether it be bone, uh, in her body and now she's having problems with it. Can I tell you, Krista, where my heart is on this? Um, surgery changes all the rules. I'll never forget how many patients used to come see us and say, I'm having a hip replacement or a knee replacement tomorrow. As we age, look, I'm a guy who jogged on my 50th birthday. I ran the White Rock half marathon, 13.1 miles. I would jog 20, 30 miles a week before that. And here I am at 70, almost two. My hips and my knees don't cause any problems. Surgery changes all the rules. A couple years ago, I saw an article, well, we don't need to do as many knee and hip replacements as we do. We're doing too many. Reminds me of 40 years ago, I read that TNAs, tonsillectomies and adenoidectomies are overdone. Uh, well, I was one of them. I got mine done because I was five and my doctor was a doctor. I, my uncle was a doctor. Um, after surgery, nerves can be cut. Bone on bone can occur. Um, I don't know what to tell you. And maybe you guys can help me here. Um, should someone with SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, uh, or suspected SIBO, avoid Dr. O'Hara's or other probiotics? No. As a matter of fact, small, bacteria, small intestinal, so the small intestine bacterial overgrowth? No. Um, these products, folks, when, when you have, like Dr. O'Hara is a prebiotic, a probiotic, and a postbiotic, it means they left their munitions behind. Whew, that makes me angry. 
they leave little factories. This is the good part. They leave little factories that help prepare for new vitamin machines in the gut and so forth. Um, always talk to your doctor. This is bad bacteria, not to be associated with good bacteria. God put good bacteria in that. We make it bad. Okay? Probiotics can help restore the terrain of the gut. Really good question. Ricky said, I had an ulcer. I started eating garlic oil. I felt much better. I don't normally take supplements every day because I know the body stores things up. That was years ago. I try not to eat or drink too many acidy things, no coffee, spaghetti at the same time. Ricky, you figured it out. Bless you, man. That's awesome. Um, uh, wow. Teresa, I went to Frontline Doctors Protocol and my hubby has had leukemia and it was a godsend to study those docs and have early treatment. Uh, me having pneumonia, asked the doctor to add nystatin trochees, also nystatin powder and antifungals, which really helped. So do you guys know this? Um, there's something called Frontline Doctors. You can look them up and study them. I've heard a lot of good things. Maybe the Kaufman diet. If I were him, I'd ask for Diflucan or Sporinox for a couple of months while on the Kaufman program and proper supplements. We talk about, you know, the supplements that we take here. Uh, all of these sitting here on the desk, caprylic acid. I would get, by the way, you guys can get this free. Uh, this is uh, immunition. He'll send you out a pack. He'll even pay the mail. Uh, extra strength, NSC 100. And those are the things I would do. I don't know the answer. I do know if the doctor agrees, it's worth a trial of, uh, you know, of the, uh, of the antifungals. Remind you also, she did get some of you contact. You want a FUPO shirt, Pam Fowler, bcac at gmail.com, bcac caps at gmail.com. You can order a shirt, Fupo head shirt. I love that thing. And uh, God bless you guys. I'm going to be away for about a week. I'll have a great time. I'll fill you in when I get back. And I won't be masked when I'm sitting here. God bless. Bye-bye.